This is a film about a man who became an artist because he missed a train. This happened many years ago. He left the station in a Manchester suburb and started to walk up the Bolton Road wondering what to do. He came to some streets of terraced houses which lay at the foot of an immense mill. As he took in the scene, he was filled with the urge to paint it. And at that moment, he decided to become an artist. His name is Lawrence Stephen Lowry. Recognition and success came to him late in life. It's not changed him in any way. Now, Lowry's source of inspiration is the man-made world which followed the Industrial Revolution in the north of England. There are no trees or grass and no landscape here. What was there in these sooty streets to make Lowry wish to spend his life amongst them, painting a world in which other people could see no beauty? I really don't know why I paint these streets. I just paint them, that's all. As far as I can see, there's something about them which attracts me the pictorial sense. But I do feel that the pictures that I like the best are pictures done entirely from, call it imagination if you like, building up scenes from the blank canvas. I like to do that the best, and I think myself that that's more me than the pictures painted from the drawings. No, I'm not a social reformer. I don't think any propaganda in my work. I just paint the scenes that I see and like. Anybody, other people paint landscapes or flowers or, or anything else. People ask how it is that Lowry can find anything worthwhile to paint in places which seem so ordinary and drab. Well, I say I'm sorry, but I can't help it. And people often tell me that, and why do you paint in such a drab subject? Well, I said, why shouldn't I paint drab subjects? I like to paint them, so why not? I might say, why do you paint such cheerful subjects? It's all a matter of the way you look at it. I think I'm about as much entitled to paint my dad subjects as anybody to paint the cheerful subjects. People often tell me that they can't sell their pictures, and I say, well, I said, you're rather unreasonable, I should say, because after all, why should you expect the people to like, buy your pictures? They haven't asked you to paint them. So why should you complain? Rather reasonable. Of people's clothes, he says. I don't bother about the clothes, I just paint the people as I see the people in my mind's eye. The clothes don't bother me. In a sense, I try to keep them. At... I just put them down as I see them. I sometimes, I do try to, in a coy and a sort of way, to uh, dress them in contemporary fashion, but it doesn't bother me. The fact that they're not of today doesn't bother me in the least. I'm not concerned with it at all. I just paint the people as I see the people. Yeah, I've often had it said to me, in fact, that your people are not of today. They are 20 or 30 years ago. How is that? Well, I say, I don't think it matters. I paint the people as I see the people. It reminds I. I don't mind at all whether they're of today or yesterday or any other time. I simply paint the people as I see them. And that's all there is to it. People often say me that, tell me that my figures are long and thin and my feet are enormous. Well, I say, I, I suppose my, my figures may be long and thin and the boots may be enormous, but I'm not concerned that. I don't mind it at all. I see them like that, so I paint them like that. That's all there is to it again. A friend of mine, a very knowledgeable gentleman indeed, used to complain very much. He used to say, you, you don't put any shadows in your pictures. That's entirely wrong, you know. And for, for quite a long time, I tried to put shadows in my pictures, and I simply couldn't do it. This weather-beaten church stands on the hill above the village of Mottram in Longdendale. Lowry now lives in this village, close to the hills, but the streets of Manchester and Salford are only a few miles away from his home. Here he lives alone with his paintings and his possessions. Amongst them are drawings by his favorite Victorian artist, D.G. Rossetti. There's also a piano and a house full of clocks, which he explains keep him company. His back room is his studio. 
He prefers working here to Manchester, London, or anywhere else. Of course, I'm getting old, and I don't think I could live in London. And I'm not, I'm, I'm by nature a person who's been, but spent a lot of time by himself, most of my life by myself, I was an only child. Work like working by myself, I can't work with others at all. And I think it keeps one's mind fresher, really, than to work with a lot of people, amongst a lot of people. In his room close to the wild hills, Lowry surrounds himself with paintings of the sprawling towns in the valleys below. How does he account for this lifelong will to paint in this way? Well, I spend the whole of my life wondering what it all means. I can't understand it. I don't understand it at all. I simply wonder. Is there any point in it itself? Still, there it is. You keep on working and you still keep on wondering what it all means and it goes on and on and on and there you are. Why are the pictures filled with so many matchstick people? You put a number of people in the picture and you find for the sake of design, you've got to put more and more and more. And by the time the picture's finished and the design can be, you've got a picture full of, full of people. That's really what it is. People call them matchstick, matchstick figures. They may be, I don't mind. If they like to call them matchstick figures, well, they'll let them do it. I don't mind at all. Quite right, they're probably quite right, but it doesn't concern me. All I do, as I said just before, is to paint figures as I see them. They may be like matchsticks, they may be any way you like, but I just do them as I like to see them. Occasionally, Lowry paints a portrait, but usually his pictures of individual people are, as he puts it, out of his head. Such people may be the products of a sharp and watchful eye, but they are intended to be fictional characterizations. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. However this may be, there is a streak of caricature in these personal inventions and more than a touch of local colour. Nothing gives Larry greater satisfaction than to paint for his own amusement on scraps of wood and on bits of board. He turns this, these bits and pieces into a gallery of little men and women who are brought to life by a few strokes of his brush. These miniature people populate his shelves and tables, they lie about the floor, they haunt the dark corners of his studio, and they lurk in between his canvases. As Lowry begins and as time goes by, he tells us how he works. Well, I think painting can get a habit like anything. You get used to painting and you paint and paint and paint. And whether you're in the mood for painting or not in the mood for painting makes no difference. You can, if you're not in the mood when you start, you get used to it and you carry on just the same. Well, I think from my own experience that the less... The, the less of the mold for painting, the better pictures you paint. I know I find that when I'm very anxious to do a thing well, I don't do it at all well, and when I don't seem to mind very much at all and nothing matters about it, it comes out all right. I start on an empty canvas and prefer to paint from my mind's eye. And uh, often not knowing at all, I have the slightest idea what I'm going to put on the canvas. In that case, I suggest something, call it a chimney or church or anything else, uh, going along slowly and adding things, and in a strange sort of a way, it seems to come. I work like that until the canvas is completely filled. And there's a sort of design on the canvas, a picture, if you like. The buildings always come before the figures. The buildings come, the pictures, the buildings always come before the figures. 
I generally start putting the figures in when I've got the, uh, the landscape, as you would call it, fairly complete. It sometimes comes very well, and sometimes, for no apparent reason, not at all well, but it could take a couple of years to paint a picture quite easily from start to finish. Of course, the, they're intricate pictures, and they're full of figures and <clears throat> detail. It all takes balancing, which is not easy to do. You work on this, as I say, not working too often or too rapidly until I find that the time comes and you can do no more with the picture. When you're satisfied with that, you leave it as complete. I see no reason in the at all, at all in the world why the centre of the picture should appear to be in the point of interest. If you can balance the picture and be satisfied that it's quite all right in your own mind, and the same with perspective. I think perspective is all right to use it as far as you need it. But I myself don't see any reason in the world to distort perspective or alter perspective or do with or exaggerate or do anything with it, if it suits your picture. After all, it's only a picture, it's all make-believe, it's not reality. And the whole thing is, can you get away with what you want to say? Uh, how can't you? Well, I feel about critics that they're quite entitled to say what they think about a thing. And if one exhibits work in public or shows in public, one must accept what they say. I was afraid of criticism, one ought, <coughs> one, <coughs> one ought not to show in public. So I feel about it. They may be quite right, you don't know them, they may be quite right, they're probably quite right as, as right as you are, and they're perfectly right in opinion. Well, a uh, friend some time ago gave me an artist's palette, he was sorry for me. But I've still got it there, just put down in a place where he gave it me. I've got a sort of... Uh, what, a, perhaps a third, a quarter of a palette. It's gone through the years, it's diminished, and so pieces have broken off, and I cling to that. I don't know why, but I cling to that. And I don't seem at all anxious to start using my palette that my friend so kindly gave me. Lowry knows the world for what it is. It can be a solitary place, and this feeling can be at its strongest when one is in the midst of a crowd. Some of his paintings express this personal experience. He paints empty houses and blank windows, and the pictures are bleak and empty too. These pictures and the things in them mirror his own feelings. People often said that, but I suppose I reflect myself and my figures are bound to do, bound to reflect myself and the figures, and I'm a very lonely sort of a person. No wish to change. I would like to paint the figures as I see them and the mills and the landscape as I see it. And I'm not at all interested in housing estates and the rest of it. I shall keep on painting, I suppose, just as I am doing now.